All right. Well, thank you guys, everyone who uh, has joined us. My name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids. I'm uh, excited to be back hosting another webinar. And thank you so much uh, for Ryan Notek for joining us today. Uh, Ryan is currently doing his PhD at UMass Boston. So I'm hoping that means he's a Red Sox fan, but we won't hold it against him if he's not. <laughs> You're not from up there, so that's all right. Um, it's, it's okay. We won't, we won't hold that against him. And uh, oh, there's only a few Yankees fans on here now who are like, oh, <laughs> anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, and he's also working as a research tech at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium, which if we do have any New Englanders up there, if you haven't been to the aquarium, pretty incredible place. I think um, I'm really interested to learn about your research, Ryan, just because I think um, a lot of times people ask, why shark science? Why are we tagging these animals? Why does it matter? And this is really an example of how important science is for conservation um, and management. So I think people are really, uh, I'm really interested in it. So uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and sharing a little bit of your time. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you get started. Awesome. Thanks a bunch. All right. And yeah, full disclosure, I am not a Red Sox fan. I am from New York. So oh, uh, no. I just wanted to clear the air right there. Yeah, clear the air. Get it? Okay, we're, we'll move past it, right? We won't hold any grudges. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Good, good, good. All right. So, uh, yeah, thanks a bunch, Jillian, for uh, virtually inviting me for this chat. I'm really excited. And thanks, everybody, that's tuning in for this. Um, I hope that you're all staying safe and healthy at home. And for all the kids, hopefully this is sort of a cool way to kick off your weekend. Um, like Jillian said, I am a student at UMass Boston. I work at the New England Aquarium. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about how fishing is impacting sharks. And this is something that has sort of interested me for a very long time. Um, let's see if I can get this PowerPoint to play first. Hold on one second. One thing you're going to see with my PowerPoint is I love animations. But the kicker to that is my computer doesn't really like animations. So give me one second. There we go. All right. Um, so like I said, fishing has been something that's been part of my life um, since the beginning. I've always really enjoyed it. And I've always loved sharks. So this is actually the first shark that I caught. It's a smooth dogfish. Um, so it's always been a part of my life. And I've always been very curious about fishing and sharks. And 10-year-old me always had these questions. Um, I just wanted to know what happened to fish when they were released. But unfortunately, 10-year-old me really had no idea how to answer those questions. So fast forward 20 years, and now I have the tools and the knowledge to answer some of these questions. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to look at how fishing is impacting uh, populations of sharks and then also sharks individually. Talk a little bit about some of the research that I'm doing and how we study all of this. And then we'll sort of wrap it up by talking about what we can do about it moving forward. So let's first start with the impacts, all right? And to talk about impacts of fishing, we first need to talk about fishing. And fishing has been around for as long as humans have been around. Um, it started out very simple. And over time, with technology advancing, we have become better and better and better to the point where now we are really good at catching fish. Um, and you can sort of break fishing up into three different parts. So you have commercial fishing, which is definitely the biggest source of fishing. Um, you have something called artisanal fishing. So this is mostly around small fishing villages. Um, and then you have recreational fishing, which I am a huge fan of. I'm guessing a lot of you like to go fishing. Um, so these are sort of the three different types of fishing. Now, all of these different types of fishing interact and catch sharks. So it's really important for us to understand what they're doing to sharks. Um, and when you look at the commercial fisheries, since there's a bunch of different types of them, uh, the ones that are really catching sharks are what's called a long line. So basically a extremely long line of hooks that can be miles and miles long. Um, you have another type of fishery called the Persane fishery, where basically they circle the net around the fish and then scoop them up. And then the last one is a gill net. So they basically put this net out and they let it float around for a while while fish run into it and get caught. 
Um, so again, all of these different fisheries, they're catching sharks. So it's really important for us to understand what they are doing to sharks. All right, so to understand what they're doing to shark populations, we have to talk about something called population dynamics. So this is basically how populations react to different things that are going on in the ocean. All right, so let's use this cartoon right here to explain it. All right, so this is gonna be my shark population, this circle of sharks right here, okay? Now, over time, what's gonna happen is some of these sharks are going to leave the population. Some of them will swim away and migrate elsewhere. And then some of them are just going to die naturally from old age and predation, things like that. But at the same time, you also have a bunch of sharks coming into the population, right? So they're migrating in. Um, you also have baby sharks. So what you have is this balance, basically, of sharks leaving and then sharks coming into the population. And when all of this is in balance, you have a very healthy shark population. So keep that in mind. You have to have this balance. So now let's think about this balance and how fishing could be affecting that balance, right? And as we know, fishing can remove sharks from a population. So let's talk a little bit more about just how that actually happens, all right? So let's sort of squish this all to the side and talk more about fishing. All right, so if I'm a commercial fisherman and I go out, first thing that's gonna happen is I am going to catch a whole bunch of sharks. So after I catch those sharks, there we go, there's the animation. Um, when I'm catching these sharks, I'm either directly fishing for them, which is called targeted fishing, um, or I'm accidentally catching them. And this is known as bycatch. But either way, these fishermen are catching sharks. And once they've caught them, they have to decide, all right, what am I gonna do with these sharks? So in some cases, these sharks are kept, all right? They're kept and they're sold at the market for things like meat. Um, there's the global fin trade and supplements. And globally, this is altogether a pretty big industry. All right, so those sharks we know are removed from a population. And then you also have some sharks that are discarded. So a lot of laws, rules, and regulations require you to throw sharks back. Um, and then sometimes the sharks just aren't worth that much, so fishermen will throw them back over as well. Now, when some of these sharks are thrown back overboard, unfortunately, they are dead when they're thrown back over. This is just because when they are caught, they're so stressed out or injuries have happened throughout the fishing process. Um, so those animals are basically removed from the population, even though they're thrown back overboard. But then you have some sharks that are thrown back over alive, which is great. You're putting these sharks back into the population. We're gonna talk more about that in a second though, because there's a lot of things that can happen when these sharks are thrown back overboard. What I want everyone to understand right now is just the fact that Fishing can remove sharks from a population, so it's really important for us to fish responsibly and not remove too many of them so we can keep that balance in the population. So if we go back to that healthy shark cartoon here, that healthy shark population cartoon, again, we need to make sure that when we're fishing for these sharks, we're not removing too many of them so we can keep that balance. But unfortunately, over time, we sort of failed at this. Um, there's been a lot of fishing that has led to population decline in a whole bunch of sharks. Um, there's estimates now upwards of a quarter of the sharks worldwide are threatened with some level of extinction. Um, and it's, again, too many of these sharks are being removed. So these are sharks, everything from oceanic white tip sharks, which is a species I work very closely with, and I'll be showing you some of the research I've done with them today. Uh, you have sawfish, hammerheads, uh, the bowmouth guitarfish, makos, threshers, whale sharks. So all of these are actually considered critically endangered under the IUCN red list because all of their populations have been overfished. Now, we have recognized this, right? And we are doing things to help these sharks recover. One of the biggest regulations that gets put into place to help sharks recover is something called prohibited measures. What that means is that if I'm out fishing, if I catch a shark, I have to, by law, throw this shark back overboard, which is fantastic because it means that more sharks are going to be released alive. But we still need to know what's happening to these sharks after they're thrown back overboard, right? So that's not the whole story. And that's what we're going to talk about next. All right, so up until this point, I've talked about sort of big picture how fishing affects populations of sharks. Now we're going to talk about how it's going to affect individual sharks. All right, and to do that, I'm gonna use another cartoon. 
Um, and this cartoon is just looking at fishing with rod and reel. So recreational fishing, again, something that I love to do, probably a lot of you like to do. Um, I'm not gonna talk as much about commercial fishing, but I can definitely answer questions about it at the end. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of walk through what happens to a shark while it's caught um, and sort of talk about potential impacts to the shark um, or as we like to call them, potential stressors, all right? So um, keep in mind while I'm going through this that these are potential stressors and sharks are very good at dealing with them. Um, and it's very different based on species as well. So one species may be able to handle this no issue, another species, they may not be as good and they may get a little bit more stressed out while they're being caught. All right, so we've hooked up on a shark. The first thing that's gonna happen is it's going to show this response called fight or flight. And that basically means it's going to burst swim away from you and it's gonna use up a lot of energy. And while it's doing that, it also sort of runs the risk of incurring some sort of physical injury from the hook that's in its mouth. Now the entire time we're fighting the shark, there's a few other things that it may run into. Uh, one of the things is that while it's on the hook, it's going to have a little bit more difficulty breathing just because it can't pass that water over its gills like it normally would, um, which can be an issue because when you're using all this energy, you're also going to need more oxygen. And then one other thing that can happen is they're going from really down deep to the surface and in some places that can go from really cold to really hot at the surface. So they're also dealing with this big temperature change. All right, now, once we have the shark boat side, uh, the next thing that happens is we're either going to bring it up out of the water, onto the boat, depending on the species, or we're gonna leave it in the water. But either way, this shark now is exposed to direct sunlight. They can't throw on sunglasses, so this can be an issue. Uh, there's actually a few studies out there that have shown within 10 to 15 minutes of that direct sunlight, sharks can actually go temporarily blind. Um, so this is one thing they may have to deal with, especially on a sunny day. But then the other thing is they're still dealing with temperature change. It can be warmer outside. You can catch them in the winter, it's going to be super cold. Um, and obviously, now that they are out of the water, they can't breathe. So that could be another issue. Um, and then again, they could be thrashing around, creating more injury, and they're going to keep using up all these energy reserves. All right. Um, so now up until this point, it's basically been a huge workout for this shark. Right, they have exercised from the beginning to the end. Um, and when they're released, it's gonna kind of show that because after you go through a huge workout, you're gonna be tired. So when you're released, you're gonna swim around a little bit slower, a little bit disoriented. And what that can do is it can turn you into lunch for bigger predators like Bruce here. All right, so that's one thing that sharks have to be concerned about when they're released. Um, and then another thing that might happen is if they have any cuts or wounds from being caught, they're also gonna be a bit more susceptible to infections or diseases. Um, and then sort of the last thing, if a shark is super stressed, it's gone through an extreme fishing event, in some cases that animal may actually die. So even though we released it alive, down the road, it actually died. So this just shows you how important it is for us to understand what's going on with this fishing process. All right, so hit the pause button here. And up until this point, I have probably just made fishing sound like it's a really, really, really bad thing to do. Not the case, all right? These are just examples of how the shark may be stressed, okay? But in reality, sharks are really good at handling all of this, um, especially some species, they're pretty good athletes. Right, so if you look at some of the different species that handle fishing really well, you have tiger sharks, you have nurse sharks. Both of these species can basically be caught, released, and go right back to their normal lives. Um, and that is the case for most sharks, especially when they're caught with rod and reel. Rod and reel really isn't too stressful for sharks, but there are some species where they really get stressed out from being caught. One of those would be the hammerhead sharks, all right? This is a species that we know through science and research, um, they just get super, super stressed out. So this just shows you how important it is for us to understand how each species reacts to being caught because then we can go back out 
and we can fish for them differently or set different regulations so that way we're a little bit more careful with the species like a hammerhead versus something like a tiger shark. All right, so talked about the impacts to sharks on a population level and individual level. Um, 10 year old me still wants to know more. So now let's talk about how we can study all of this. All right, um, so now we'll sort of go into some of the research that I've been doing. Um, and a lot of this research, again, I'm going to be talking about uh, oceanic white tip sharks. It is a species that I have probably worked with the most. And then I'll sort of talk here and there about some of the other species I've been working with recently. All right, so uh, the first thing I want to do is talk about a technique that we use to study the capture process, right? So when we're looking at how a shark, uh, how much energy it's used when it's being caught, um, potentially what kinds of behaviors are leading to more injury or make it more difficult for them to breathe. Um, this is the technique we use. So what we do is on the line, we put a video camera. So this is called a go fish camera. It's specifically designed for fishing. Um, and then below that, we put something called an accelerometer. So what that accelerometer does is it's going to measure the acceleration of the shark at a very high rate. Um, and we can use that to figure out how much energy the animal has used up while it was being caught. All right, so let's take a look at some video. Bear with my computer again. It's not the best with animations and video, so hopefully it plays. All right, so here I am, and we're gonna be working with that species oceanic predator shark. So you can see, we throw the line out, it has that camera, it has the accelerometer on it. And bites onto that hook, it shows that fight or flight response that I talked about. So it's using a whole bunch of energy right there to try to escape. Um, and what we've seen with some sharks is if they exhibit more of this, they're obviously going to use more energy, which in turn makes them potentially more stressed at the end of it. So this is something we try to keep track of throughout the capture event. And then there's a couple different types of behaviors that we also see while a shark is being fought. So here's an example of a shark. Like, you know, after they go through that fight or flight experience, um, they basically start to recover, right? So they're no longer as stressed out. They can start to get more oxygen um, and they do this recovery swimming pattern. But not all species show the same thing, all right? And then, Another sort of behavior that we can see is the animal especially for this species. So oceanic white tip sharks are what's called obligate ram ventilators, uh, which means they need to be swimming in order to push water over their gills and breathe. So when we see a behavior like this, we know that we need to do something to try to reduce the amount of time sharks are showing this behavior, right? So what we can do with this tool, if we take a step back, is we can look at each shark and what types of behavior they're showing when they're being caught. And then what we can do is we can go back and change the type of fishing gear that we're using or change how we're catching these fish. So that way we reduce those really harmful behaviors like hanging on the hook right here. So this is one tool and technique that I like to use. All right, the next thing that we like to do is once the shark is boat side, we basically give it a checkup as if you were going to the doctors, right? We wanna look at how the whole capture process has affected the shark. Uh, this right here is a picture basically of myself and my team working up an oceanic white tip shark. Um, we're all working on it at the same time to give it a checkup so that way we can release it very quickly so we don't stress the shark out anymore. Now, what I am really interested in when I'm doing a doctor's checkup of a shark is their blood, right? The blood can tell us a whole bunch about what's going on inside the animal, um, how much energy it may have used, and basically how stressed out the shark is. 
So this right here is just a video of me drawing blood from one of these oceanic white tips. Um, you can actually see the shark is flipped upside down. And you may have seen this in some of the other webinars. Um, it's called tonic immobility. And basically when you flip the shark over, it sort of chills, and relaxes there while I can draw a quick blood sample from the shark. All right, so after I have this blood sample, now I'm gonna run it through a bunch of really expensive instruments. Um, and really all they do is they just give me a bunch of values, all right? And these values look at certain parts of your blood that can tell me whether or not you are stressed. All right, so if I'm looking at this blood and I wanna know if you're stressed, two of the things I'm going to look at are your pH levels and lactate, all right? Now what's cool is what I'm seeing in a shark is very similar to what I would see in a human after going through a really hard workout or playing a serious game of tag, all right? The more energy that you use, the more stressed you may be just like a shark. So when I see a shark that is stressed, what's gonna happen is its pH is going to decrease. So its blood actually becomes acidic and then its lactate levels are going to increase, right? So basically with this blood, I get a snapshot of just how stressed these sharks are. And then when I compare them, I can see which sharks are more stressed out than others. So this just gives you an idea of one of the ways we give a shark a checkup after it's caught. Okay, so the next thing I am really interested in is, especially 10 year old me, what happens after we throw these sharks back over, right? Um, and to figure this all out, we use electronic tags. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen different types of electronic tags, maybe heard some talks about how they're used. Um, one of the tags I like to use is called a satellite tag. So this right here, is a video of a satellite tag on a thresher shark. So we're gonna jump aside from oceanic white tips for a second. Uh, you can see the tag right below its dorsal fin there. And it's just basically a fancy earring for this shark, right? And I like to tag these sharks so I can get information about whether or not they survived when they were released, um, if they showed any sort of recovery that might show that they were stressed, um, and also to see if they ended up being lunch for Bruce at some point. All right, so these satellite tags, once they're put back over on a shark, um, the sharks can swim around for a while and then eventually that tag is going to pop up. Now, while that tag is on the shark, it's recording the pressure, which I can figure out the depth of the shark from. Um, it's recording the water temperature and it's recording the light levels. So the tag holds all this information in and then at the end, when the tag floats to the surface, it basically transmits all of that data to a satellite, and then that satellite throws all the data back to me on this computer that I'm talking to you from. So it's really convenient. Um, and from there, I can see just where that shark was up and down in the water column. Um, and I can also do something called geolocate the shark, which is basically looking at it on a map and see where it's been. So think of it like Google Maps. All right. So what does this all look like? So this right here is a graph that when I was looking through it this morning, didn't come out as great as I wanted to. So I'll kind of walk you through it, right? So as I play this graph out, what you're gonna see are different points. And the points are the depth of the shark after it's released. And then the color of the points is gonna show you the water temperature. So the cooler colors, colder water, and the warmer colors, hotter water, all right? So what you see with this shark, and this is from an oceanic white tip, is after it's released, it sort of hangs out in deeper, cooler water where there's more oxygen, all right? And then after that, 12 hours or so, when it's recovered and it's ready to go again, it goes back to normal swimming, right? And this is something that we see in a lot of different sharks. Once they're released, they take a little while to chill out, relax, recover, and then they go back to normal. Um, and this is what we want to see, all right? So this is just an example of some of the data. All right, now, one other tag that I have used a bunch recently is called an acceleration data logger. Um, I've used this on some smaller species. So this right here is a black nose shark that I tagged just before this whole quarantine um, down in Florida. And these tags are very similar to a satellite tag and that they are gonna give you that depth and temperature profile of the shark as it's moving through the water column. But 
it's a little bit different because it's also going to record the acceleration of the shark at an extremely high rate. So I'm going to know the acceleration of the shark 25 times per second. And because I have all of this data, I can figure out some really cool things about the shark. So I know basically the roll and the pitch of the shark as it's swimming, so the orientation of the shark. And then I can also even figure out individual tail beats of the shark as it's swimming, right? And that's really useful because sometimes if I go back and look at the profile of the shark, I can see it trying to escape from a bigger predator because its tail beats all of a sudden start to speed up a whole bunch. So this is a really cool type of tag that we can use to figure out what happens to a shark after it's been released. Now, the only difference here and the kicker to this is that once that tag pops up, it has so much data that it actually can't transmit it all through a satellite, which means I have to go back out on a boat and I have to find it using this big antenna. Um, it's basically like finding a needle in a haystack where we are just driving around for miles and miles in the ocean uh, to find this tag. So that's one of the differences, but it's never a bad day when you're on the water. All right, so um, that right there sort of wraps up the types of research that I have been sort of most involved with um, to study all of this. So 10 year old me at this point is pretty happy, um, but I still wanna talk a little bit about what we can do about all of this moving forward, all right? So for me as a shark scientist, my main goal with all of this is I am trying to provide management with really important data to help them support, protect, and help shark populations recover, right? I am gonna go out and I'm gonna tell them from my research how many sharks are being removed from a population, so that way they can basically set these limits on how many sharks can be removed. Because remember, we wanna keep that balance in the population to keep them healthy. Now, something else I'm really trying to do is provide something called best fishing practices. So what that means is that for all those sharks that are being thrown back overboard alive, I wanna figure out ways to fish for them that's going to stress them out the least. So that way when they're thrown back over, they are completely healthy and they can go back to just their normal daily routine. So that's sort of my job as a shark scientist. Now for everyone watching, a couple other things, all right? So the first thing would just be follow rules and regulations that are being put out by management, right? For you kids, if you're going out fishing with your parents, make sure your parents know the regulations, how many sharks you can catch um, or keep, or if you can take the shark out of the water or not. So follow those because there's a lot of work that goes behind that to make sure that these sharks are healthy when they're released. Um, and the other thing is, you know, just fish responsibly. Um, this means when you catch a shark, you don't have to take a thousand selfies with the shark, all right? One selfie will do. Um, and, you know, most importantly, keep fishing, all right? I, I don't want this talk to sound as if fishing is a very bad thing because it's not when it's done responsibly. Um, it's really important because it basically connects us with nature. We're allowed to see these incredible animals um, and it's fun, right? I have been fishing for all my life and I'm gonna keep fishing. Tomorrow morning, I'm probably gonna go to a river right near me and fish some more. Um, so keep up fishing, right? Just do it responsibly. And then sort of the last thing, and I don't think those pictures, unfortunately, were removed. Nope, all right, so behind those pictures, I have become a shark scientist, all right? If you love sharks and you love fishing, please continue to, you know, be intrigued and learn about all of this stuff. So that way, down the road, you can help me figure out all these in questions uh, so that way we can better manage species moving forward. All right, so um, sort of before I wrap up, um, you know, again, I wanna thank you, Jillian, for allowing me to come out and chat virtually with everybody. Um, I have been blown away with the outreach that you have been doing. Um, and for everyone else that's watching too, you know, if you want to stay uh, in, in contact with the aquarium, um, definitely jump over to their YouTube. Uh, we're doing virtual visits pretty much every day. So even though you're at home, uh, we can sort of bring you into the aquarium and show you what's going on when no one's around, which is really cool because a lot of these animals act very differently when there's not a thousand people around them. Um, and then also we are sharing a bunch of our research through the aquariums platform. So definitely take a peek at that. 
Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I think, you know, you've raised a really valid point of, you know, students that are watching now, this is something you're interested in. You know, Ryan's talk, we've shared a lot of these talks. Follow these people on, on social pages, go to their research pages, their websites, learn more, spend the time um, and find out, you know, what they're doing and, um, you know, who they're working with, their projects. There's a lot of amazing materials out there um, to, to do some research and start kind of figuring out what you might be interested in because, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting. Um, and, you know, as Ryan said is, we need you guys. There's still, if, if you guys have watched me host these sessions before, you've heard me say there are so many things about sharks we have no idea. Um, and we're learning new things every day. New species are being discovered, uh, you know, new techniques for research. So yeah, these are questions that you might answer when you grow up or you might develop a new tag that is used if you're more into engineering. I mean, so yeah, so if you're watching these, uh, yeah, just uh, you know, have an explore, keep up, go to these places, check them out. I'm sure if you have a question, you know, Ryan's information is there, send them a question. Um, don't be afraid to ask and, and learn a little bit more because these, uh, you know, these people are working uh, day in and day out in these fields. Um, and so, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing resource. So we have a lot of thank yous. Um, and uh, uh, people saying they really enjoyed the presentation and uh, so we're gonna get started. So uh, thank you guys for the questions and, and for uh, the comments and um, The question I like to start with but we've had a few people ask as well is uh, Hannah and Mahai and hope I'm saying that right uh, Want to know what your favorite shark is and this is sometimes a tough one. Do you have a favorite shark? That is such a tough question, and I wish I could just say all of them, <laughs> but then we'd be here for hours and hours and hours talking. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think for me, it's the oceanic white tip shark. It's a species that I've been very lucky to have worked with. Um, you know, it's one of those species that's critically endangered. We really don't know a lot about the shark at all. Um, and yeah, I was sort of lucky enough to roll into uh, some research with them. So I've just been around them a lot. So that's definitely my favorite shark. Very cool. They're, they're at the top of my list. I've, uh, Duncan, my husband, has gotten to film and do some projects with you. And, oh, yeah. And yep. I've seen them quite a few times. And I'm like, listen. <laughs> and we actually were talking about one that was going to happen now-ish. Yes. Uh, that obviously um, I was hoping to be part of. But uh, the world has sort of flipped on its head for all of us. So, yep. uh, you know, I'm hoping, I just think they're such a, a stunning animal and not like, I mean, they're all sharks, but some of these species, like you look at them, they're just so different than the others. And, Absolutely. Uh, they have a personality. Like some sharks don't really have a personality. Oceanic white tips have personality. Yeah. That, well, that's like we see with our great hammerheads. Like they definitely, yeah. you spend, I think too, when you spend enough time with a species, Absolutely. you start to see that more. And, and uh, I always love sharing that with students and people. Like when you say personality, they go, a shark, really? What? And you're like, no, <laughs> they, they really, really do. And, uh, and so I think it's amazing when you get to spend that much time with them. So, Absolutely. um, We've had Sydney, thank you so much, because Sydney, I think you've been on every call that I've hosted. So this is amazing. Sydney is definitely a future marine biologist for sure. Um, Sydney would like to know, why did you choose this kind of work or this job? I, I think it, you kind of talked about fishing. It seemed like it was natural, you were born into it, but there, are there anything else like what really pushed you to sort of um, pursue this? And, you know, obviously it's challenging. There's a lot of hard work, but what kind of drove you to continue with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think about it all the time. Uh, so yeah, I mean, fishing definitely was like sort of the, the beginning for me. Um, but I, you know, I've just been so fascinated with sharks. Um, and I've, over time, you know, through all my studies and just learning more and more, I've realized how important it is that we protect and conserve sharks, right? They are an extremely important part of our ecosystem, but unfortunately, so many of them have been removed at this point that it's sort of our responsibility to find ways to help these populations to recover because we have been the reason that a lot of them have had these huge population declines. So I actually feel like I have a responsibility now 
to help protect these sharks and help them recover. Um, so I have the responsibility on one side. I've got you know the interest on the other side. I love sharks, and then throw in the fact I love fishing, and it's it's meant to be. Yeah, I think it's yeah, and one of the things too to remember for the students watching is that even if you're not, maybe you don't want to be a scientist, maybe that's not, but there's still art and writing, and again maybe you're an engineer, that's how your brain works, and you like building or creating things. Um, you know, think about the equipment that's being used that Ryan's using to help study sharks. Uh, so there's a lot of ways, and I think you talk about, you combined your passions, it was things that you were interested in. So take a look at that and, uh, you know, follow that, because chances are if you're really interested in something, it's a good idea that you might wanna have a career. And it, you know, regardless of sharks or science or anything, like. Yeah, and as you get older, I think you're going to realize like you want to be happy and love what you do. And those passions and those hobbies and interests might be a good sort of arrow in the direction. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth exploring those and seeing what's out there. So, um, Hannah wanted to know if you ever get scared. Uh, I assume like working with sharks or maybe diving with the sharks. Um, do you ever get scared working with sharks? Because obviously a lot of people out there think sharks are scary um yeah yeah a lot of people think they're scary and i think that's it's unfortunate that they have this sort of you know jaws has scared the world basically um the way i look at it is at the end of the day these are apex predators and they are wild right so for me it's i'm not scared of them i respect them um so if i'm in the water uh you know diving with them or i'm working with them both side I'm just always aware that these are very powerful predators. Um, and you know, I'm just always keeping that in the back of the mind. So I wouldn't say I'm scared, but I'm just respectful of the fact that they are powerful predators. Um, and that sort of separates the two, I think. Yeah, I, I say that a lot um, to people is, I think they're not puppy dogs, they're not pets. They're amazing, don't get me wrong. I love sharks and a baby nurse shark yeah you want to just it's so cute and it's uh, covered in spots but it's all about they are wild animals and we absolutely from start to finish every moment with them you have to respect them and I think what happens is you know sometimes people they get complacent um, they get they lose that uh, and something happens and it's you know human error and uh, it's just it's really really important to remember how lucky we are that we can get in the water. Uh, I know this analogy, people use this all the time, but you couldn't walk through the Serengeti with like a big steak and try and like hand feed lions. Yes. Wouldn't end well. Um, I'm just gonna but, say that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's great because it's it makes sense, right? Yes. We're so lucky that these are, you know, top predators. I mean, not all of them, but they're this amazing animal that has been around for, you know, over 400 million years. It's good at being a shark. It's good at surviving, like the things you talked about, their abilities um, to, to tolerate a lot of these, um, you know, pressures we're imposing on them. And uh, yeah, so to be able to be in their world, even for just a few moments, is, is remarkable. So um, yeah, I, think that, I love that answer. And um, we have, um, is it Mrs. Notek? I assume it's uh, Mrs. South from... Uh, Oh, yeah, I think that's <laughs> cool. And Saratoga uh, has her STEM students here and says she thinks they may have some future shark scientists. So that's awesome. I love that my mom's a teacher as well. So uh, awesome. very, very cool uh, and uh, awesome. So, okay, so Paola wants to know if you think that shark fishing regulations have been helpful and do you think for the most part that people are following them? I guess it's kind of that's just Paola, so you know, that's a pretty broad question because it's very regional but you know overall I guess like what what have you seen that's a really good question um so you know I it's it's hard to speak to the whole globe um but I would say like here in the U.S. um as far as following things and and you know help having some of these regulations help sharks recover absolutely we're doing a good job of it at this point um, I think that we have recognized a lot of the issues and we are taking steps towards a lot of these species recovering. Um, and as far as, you know, I'd say regulations um, being followed outside of the U.S., that's kind of hard to speak to. 
um, I think, so like, here's a great example. Um, in the US, you know, right now, uh, oceanic white tips are obviously prohibited, right? Um, which is great, we're taking the step to help the shark recover. But just recently, um, I was with Duncan down in Haiti, and now you have these small fishing villages that live off of what they're catching from the sea. So if they go out and catch an oceanic white tip, that's gonna feed their family, right? So it's really hard to generalize and say that regulations here need to be the same regulations there. There's a lot that goes into it, um, but I think the US in general, um, I think we're doing a good job. And most importantly, we are absolutely doing the research to take the steps in the right direction to help a lot of sharks recover. Yeah, and it's, it's not simple. It's, you know, I think for all of us, if we could say we love sharks, protect them, but, but it's not that easy and governments need data. And this is really, you know, I've said this on quite a few of the talks is that science, the reason shark tagging happens, these studies, all of this is, yeah, awesome. Sharks are amazing. We love them. We love working with them, but it's critical. We can't go to governments and say, all right, you need to protect this uh, area during this season because there's a natural aggregation or these sharks are coming here to breed or give birth this time of year. Uh, so it, you have to have that data, that information. And, you know, you look in the Bahamas and it's a shark sanctuary, but it's a big place and like monitoring all of this. And you really, it's, it's becomes more complicated and it really is important to involve the local community. And I think, you know, you saw some of that in Haiti is, you can't just go into a place and say, you're bad, you're wrong, you've got to change this. You have to work with the local community at a grassroots level, find out their needs, their challenges, and then build it from there and involve the community. And when that doesn't happen, conservation isn't a success because you've put laws in and you're coming from somewhere else and you've not worked with the local people. And so, yeah, in the, in the US there are, but it's data-based as well. It's science-based, there's research. So, but when you go to other places that yeah, people are relying on whatever they catch that day to feed their family, you're facing a whole new challenge. And it isn't a simple black and white. There's a lot of, you know, gray area and challenges. And so, yeah, I think- um, That's why we need more shark scientists. <laughs> exactly, exactly. To get out there and, and to get involved and understand that each location is yeah. very, very different. Even yeah, and it's also, you know, I think it's very different too, depending on the species, right? So if you have a, let's say a coastal species, so like one of the ones I'm working right now is the black nose shark, right? We know that that population is really only around the mid-Atlantic and the Florida coast, right? So I know if I'm putting in a regulation there, it's only going to apply to basically that population. When you're talking about something like an oceanic white tip, they go all over the world. Right. So it's way harder to manage one of those species with regulations because it could be in the U.S. one day, the Bahamas the next, Haiti, Cuba, Dominican Republic. It can go anywhere it wants. So yeah. that makes it more challenging for those species, for sure. They don't know the areas. I always tell people like, uh, you know, we have great hammerheads in Bimini, critically endangered species protected there. 50 miles, there's Florida you know, um, or head further south. And so, yeah, it's, it is, it's really important to understand, um, yeah, their migration. And these tags are helping us do that because most sharks, uh, you know, with the exception, I know sharks kind of stay in the same area. There are ones, you know, I mean, but they do apparently travel. Uh, there's a people that came out one like 200 miles. And, yep. Uh, so, <laughs> what? Um, but, yeah. It's definitely, that's challenging. And, and so when you remove that tiger shark, it's not just removing it from one ecosystem, it's removing it from every ecosystem that it visits and, and has a you know part of its life in. Uh, so yeah, there's all sorts of challenges that you know depend on the species. And, and uh, you guys, if you haven't seen a black nose shark as well, they're really cute, not a big yeah. shark. We do get them in Bimini, they have a little smudge on the tip of their nose. <laughs> they're adorable. Yeah, and they're really cool. We have a spot that we get to swim with them. And uh, yeah, they're really, really fun. A little skittish, but they do come, yes. they come in after a while. Uh, <laughs> really, really cute little chubby shark. I love them. Um, yeah, but check that out. Look them up because a lot of people don't know what they are. And actually, if you look, if you guys, the bottom left, believe it or not, it's hard to see, but those are a couple little black nose down there. Oh, yeah. um, all right. So what would you say, um, how can people like educate 
the public? What would you want, what would you tell people to say or mention if you're talking about, and we had somebody else that asked, you know, best advice, you know people that are, are fishing or fishermen, um, you know, are there things that you can do as just a general citizen, like to, to share this information? What would you advise people to say or, or do? Uh, you know, this is gonna sound kind of weird, but I would say put yourself in the shark's position, right? If, if you are being reeled in by a shark, um, you're gonna wanna be released as quickly as possible. Um, and I, I think that's one way of looking at it. They're animals, just like we're animals. Um, so the biggest thing I would say is if you're talking to someone fishing, just, you know, convey to them, like, look, these are wild animals. They don't want to be caught. You're taking them out of their natural environment. You're stressing them out. So when you do catch them, just please throw them back as quickly as possible. Um, you, again, you don't need to take a thousand selfies with them. Um, and I, I think that's like the, the, the easiest thing to do is, you know, put yourself in the shark's shoes. And I think you mentioned too, know the rules. Know yes, the rules absolutely. Here. And I think most responsible fishermen bother to know the rules. But I mean, I see in the Bahamas, I see people come over uh, and they don't know the season. And we do have seasons. We have lobster season. We have limits on conch. We have NASA grouper season. And people come over the size limits. And they just, and I think it's your responsibility. Um, you know, one, it's the government for creating, making sure people have access to those rules, but then it is your responsibility as someone who's choosing to get to go do this activity to know the rules and regulations. So, um, you know, making sure wherever you are is, do you have to have a permit? Is there a size, a season? Like take a little time, do your research and be, you know, a very conservation minded participant, um, rather than just, you know, ignoring that. And, uh, because it can be hard to police. We kind of have to sell it. Police. Yeah, it's, it's not easy to police at all. It, not at all. Actually, like commercial fishing is almost easier to police than recreational. Yeah. So, man, answering now. I'm just trying to note to people that you're um, doing these now. Um, all right. So, Felix said, being a shark scientist sounds really interesting. Do you have a favorite part or something that you found to be most interesting about studying sharks? I would say that's a really good question. Um, I love the unknown, right? Like if I'm going to study a shark, I'm doing something that nobody has done before. Um, if I'm looking at, you know, the oceanic white tip or the black nose shark, and I want to see what's happening to them when they're caught, when I'm looking at it, um, that's a first, right? So I think for me, that is probably one of my favorite parts about being a shark scientist. Um, there's so many questions that have not been answered about these sharks um, that it's sort of cool to be on the front line. Um, and then it's also just super rewarding, right? Like learning these facts and then being able to provide them to management as a scientist, that's, I mean, that's exactly what I want to do. Um, so yeah, I think those are sort of the, the, the two points that jump out to me for sure. Yeah. Um, and somebody else asked, um, uh, well, Sydney, thank you. Sydney said that he or she, I apologize, I'm not sure what's spelling the name. Um, I've watched every webinar. Awesome. Um, Sydney, if you can, I'm going to send you a message, but send us an email because I feel like we're going to send you a little something. And that's really amazing that you've, you've been this committed. Uh, so that, and I've, I've seen you ask questions on every one I've hosted. So um, what is the hardest or most challenging part about studying sharks? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> they're definitely, yeah. So uh, this is, this is kind of funny. So, I mean, when people, you know, look at my Instagram or something like that, or they look at shark scientists, they always see the highlight reel. They always see us working with sharks, this and that, all the cool stuff. Um, the reality is I cannot tell you how many hours I have spent on a boat bobbing around doing absolutely nothing. Uh, sharks are not the easiest things to catch. You never know where they're gonna be. Um, so I think the, the hardest part about being a shark scientist is nothing is set in stone. When you go out there, you have no idea what's gonna happen. You have to be ready to you know, change your game plan on a dime. Um, there's no certainty at all. And it's a lot, a lot, a lot of waiting around. Um, so yeah, every time you see that highlight reel, just remember for that, 10 second clip, there's probably 10, 20, 30, 40 hours just to get that one little clip. 
I've said that quite a few times too, is, is people don't see the logistics, the planning, the months, the hard work, the time behind the computer. Um, you know, all of us now who are posting would be computer work, right? It was, we're not out in the field because you want to highlight the successful part and the exciting and the interesting part. Uh, but there's a lot that goes into this and it's really challenging. And, and, you know, we're lucky in the Bahamas because it's pretty easy to find the sharks. But a lot of places around the world, in most places, like maybe you're looking for a particular size, uh, has to be male or female, um, and you know you have to go there during the right season. I mean, there's a lot of challenges, and, and people don't see that. So, um, yeah, I think it's it is important to remember it's the cool stuff that you see, the highlight reel, and that's even shows you see on TV, like the days, the hours, the weeks that went into getting that one shot. Um, yeah, it's it's not always you don't see the behind the scenes and uh, and that's the work that you know is challenging but also is when you finally do get that one shark or that tag on it it's that's the reward yeah and i mean even if you're bobbing around in the ocean a day out at sea is a lot better than behind a desk that's true, that's true. <laughs> all right so we're going to finish with one last question um what uh is one thing that if you would tell people about sharks what do you wish that sharks um or people knew about sharks. You could give them one kind of bit of information. You wish the world that everyone knew this about these animals. Oh boy, that is a loaded question. Um, so, you know, I think one thing that often doesn't get talked about enough or people don't really understand the importance of it is just how important a shark is to an ecosystem. Uh, we always say, save the sharks, save the sharks. Um, but we don't really, not everyone knows why we need to save the sharks, right? So um, I think if there's one take home for people to really know and understand about a shark is that they are one of the most important parts of an ecosystem. Um, most of these sharks are top predators. And if you remove that top predator, then it's gonna have this trickle down effect, right? The fish that they were eating at one point, now that population of fish explodes and eats all of the fish below it. And eventually the whole ecosystem is just thrown out of whack. Um, so I, I, you know, I really think it's important for people to understand sort of the gravity of how important sharks are to an ecosystem um, besides just realizing how cool they are. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for your time, your knowledge, sharing your research with us. Thank you to everyone who joined today. Um, make sure if you want to watch this again, or maybe if you missed part of it or you want to share it, it will be on the Sharks for Kids website. Uh, links to follow Ryan and continue and keep up with his research are all there as well. So uh, again, if you know, you're interested or want to learn more, those are some great resources to explore uh, and watch the video again so you can check out even more. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ryan. Everyone have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks a bunch.